So now we come to the next part of the lecture, which I think is the of the most interesting applications of Fourier series, and that's uh, using Fourier series to solve separable partial differential equations. So suppose that we want to solve the heat equation. Specifically the 1D heat equation. For the temperature function along a one-dimensional bar. We've seen before that this is the equation K times du squared, the second derivative of temperature with respect to position, is equal to du dt. Where k is, could in general be a function of um, either temperature or position or time, but uh, we're going to assume that k is constant. This is called the thermal diffusivity of the medium. So the partial differential equation here is this heat equation, <coughs> and we actually have to always specify certain boundary conditions. So we'll say that the bar has goes from zero to some length. B and you know the boundary conditions are actually what are going to make this a separable differential equation and there are um, <coughs> many different types of boundary conditions that we could put on this uh, this this problem but uh, the easiest boundary conditions are having a zero boundary condition on the left-hand side of the bar, so zero temperature on the left-hand side of the bar, and a temperature of zero at B as well, for all times T. And there are many other uh, boundary conditions that can be put on the bar. Some will result in more simple boundary conditions, will result in solution uh, via Fourier series, this separable um, PDE. <clears throat> However, some boundary conditions, if they're complicated, uh, require a little bit more intense analysis. Uh, we also have initial conditions as well, which means that at time t0, t0 equals 0, the initial temperature distribution will be some function f of x. So 
So I'll go through and show how to solve this PDE using the method of separation of variables, which relies heavily on uh, the boundary conditions of this problem um, and uh, on the idea of Fourier series analysis. So uh, suppose that we can find a solution of the form u of xt is equal to some function of x times some function of t. <coughs> and this is sometimes called an ansatz. So we're going to look and see if we can find the solution of this form. Um, and it turns out that if we can find solutions of this form for a uh, linear uh, partial differential equation, uh, we can collect all of the solutions of this form and add them together um, and get uh, the true general solution to this problem because of the linearity of this partial differential equation right here. Um, so what we're going to do is start by looking for solutions of this form and see what that's going to imply about the solution. Um, and so we'll determine the PDE star and we're going to substitute this assumption or this ansatz into star and see what that implies about a separable solution of PDE. When we do this, we get the equation k times the second derivative of x, which is a function of x, times capital T, which is only a function of t, has to be equal to the t partial derivative of x times capital T and uh, because x is a function of x, a single variable function of x and capital T is a single variable function of T, this reduces to k times x double prime times T is equal to x times t prime. And you might ask, well, what is this really doing for us? Uh, because um, this seems to be overcomplexifying things, but uh, we have some real magic that happens here uh, if we rewrite this equation. Right? If this equation is to hold, then x double, double prime divided by x will have to be equal to capital T prime over T times K. And you want to pause for a moment and take a look at what we have here. The left-hand side of this equation is a single variable function of X. And the right hand side of this equation is a single variable function of t. And I want you to think for a little bit about what this implies, but uh, what it implies is something very special. If you have that 
a single variable function of x is equal to, specifically a ratio of two single variable functions of x is equal to a ratio of two single variable functions of t only, um, the only way uh, of having this be true is if um, both sides or both ratios are equal to some constant value. Uh, neither of these ratios can be functions of either of the variables, otherwise uh, what we have here would not be possible to do or satisfy, so we wouldn't be able to satisfy this equation. And this is really the key uh, thing to note when uh, we're looking at this uh, separability. Um, is that this entire, both of these expressions have to be equal to some constant c, which we'll actually solve for and figure out exactly what values it can take on. This is why this constant c is sometimes called the separation constant. of the boundary value problem. This uh, PDE coupled with whatever boundary conditions and initial conditions you have is called a boundary value problem. <coughs> and what's really nice here is that uh, because each of these two equations have to be equal to the same constant C, then we get um, A second order differential equation that has to be satisfied in x and a first order differential equation that has to be satisfied by the function t. And this is really special because uh, what we've effectively done by uh, assuming this ansatz is shown that uh, any uh, separable solution to this, uh, this PDE here um, has to satisfy what well, the X function has to satisfy this second order uh, ODE um, and the T function, capital T, for the heat equation in order to satisfy this if it's separable. Um, has to satisfy this first order differential equation. Um, and uh, so what we've essentially done is taken our partial differential equation and converted it uh, for a separable solution into uh, two uh, ordinary differential equations, which uh, should be more familiar to solve. And uh, this is really the heart of this method. Um, So this first sort of differential equation is just the exponential equation, and it, it has the uh, general solution uh, for any initial temperature of T naught times E to the KC times T. And um, this this is a general solution that's valid regardless of what the sine of C is. If C is negative or positive, 
this will still be the same solution. Uh, however, uh, this uh, requires a little bit more uh, of uh, an investigation. Um, specifically, we have to look at uh, right, what the, the if if we get physical solutions uh, for given boundary values. Remember the uh, boundary conditions here for a separable solution. will need to be satisfied by the solutions of this ordinary differential equation. And the boundary conditions then reduce for the separable equation to x of 0 times t of t equals 0 and the second boundary condition will be satisfied if x of b times capital T of t is equal to zero. And these have to be true for all values of t. So what this means is that we actually have to uh, put on specific, our specific boundary conditions onto x. And it's this step where things become a little bit um, more difficult if the boundary conditions are more, are more complicated. Uh, it's still possible uh, in many cases to do separation of variables with more complicated boundary conditions. However, uh, you do need to be careful at this step uh, when you're solving for x. Um, so you're solving for this differential equation right here. Um, but we're choosing to go over the simplest possible scenario now just to kind of get the idea down. <clears throat> and it's important to point out that mathematically this is called a sturm louisville problem, or a problem of sturm louisville type. Uh, where we have this uh, second order linear inhomogeneous ODE with specific boundary conditions that have to be satisfied. Um, and uh, the theory of Sturm Louisville, Sturm Louisville problems is very, very intimately related with uh, what we're doing here and whether or not we can solve a given uh, uh, partial differential equation using the method of separation of variables. So I, I encourage you to read further into that if you're interested. But um, just kind of going over the general idea here, uh, we have three different possible values for C. The first possible value for C is C positive, in which case the solution to this differential equation in general will be x of x is equal to some constant d1 times hyperbolic cosine of the square root of the absolute value of c times x plus some constant d2 times hyperbolic sine of the square root of the absolute value of c times x. And um, you know, these can be written in terms of uh, exponentials, positive and negative exponentials as well. Uh, however, the, for applying the boundary conditions here, um, hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine are a little bit uh, easier to see what uh, what's going on. Because if we go through and try to solve for our constants, d1 and d2, when we plug in 0 here, we get that this is going to be d1 times 1 plus d2 times 0, and this has to be equal to 0 to satisfy our boundary condition, which implies that d1 is equal to 0. And so when we go to satisfy our other boundary condition at b, this becomes d2 times hyperbolic sine of the square root of the absolute value of c times b has to be equal to zero. And uh, the only way of satisfying this boundary condition is again, 
uh, making d2 equal 0. Because the only place that the hyperbolic sine is 0 is when d is 0, and that would be when the bar is 0. Um, so this case is no good. I should say the case c positive is no good because there are no non-trivial solutions. Right? There are no solutions to this partial differential equation that are separable uh, where this c value is strictly positive. We can go through and do this exact same thing for c equals zero. And when c equals zero, the general solution x as a function of x is going to be some d1 times x plus some constant d2. And again, when we go to satisfy our boundary conditions, x of 0 is just d2, which implies d2 would have to equal 0. And x at d, which is the length of the bar, will be d1 times d. And uh, x or d2 is 0. So the only way of making this equal to 0 is, again, if d1 and d2 are both equal to 0, just like in the previous case. So again, there are no non-trivial or non-zero solutions to the boundary value problem here that are separable and sat that satisfy these boundary conditions with c equal to zero. And so the last hope here is that we can find a class of non-zero or non-trivial solutions for c less than zero. Specifically, I uh, will take c equal to negative omega squared and try and see if we can figure out what omega is. So remember, uh, in the case c positive, you get the differential equation x double prime minus absolute value of c times x equals zero. In the case of c equals zero, you get the differential equation x double prime is equal to zero, which is where this solution right here is coming from. And in the case of c negative, we have the differential equation x double prime plus omega squared times x is equal to zero. And I'll use omega squared up here as well, just to be specific. And when we go through and solve this, Solution to this second order differential equation is going to be of the form A times cosine of omega times x plus B times sine of omega times x. Where a and b are constants, and we have to satisfy the boundary conditions. 
x of 0, this cosine of 0, which is 1, so a times 1 plus b times 0 has to be equal to 0. So a is 0, we satisfy this boundary condition. <coughs> and things aren't looking too good, but sure enough, that some magic happens when we go to apply the boundary condition at b. x of b is going to be b times sine of omega times d, which has to equal 0. And sure enough, that there are infinitely many possible solutions to this equation right here. Specifically, um, right, for any value omega, where omega is equal to n times pi over b, n is equal to 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2, and so on and so forth, uh, we have a solution to our equation. And I want to note that the negatives are non-physical. Which is why uh, we can take the following step. So we have infinitely many possible solutions here uh, to our, um, our, our this Sturm-Louisville problem with C negative. So the general solution then in terms of n is un of x comma t is equal to x and of x times t and of t which is b and times sine of n pi over b times x times t naught n e to the negative omega n times k omega n squared times k times t. Which I'll abbreviate for the constant. Right? t naught here is an arbitrary constant, depends on neutral condition. Same thing with bn. So I'll just abbreviate this entire thing as lowercase bn. This is where the, the real magic happens. Because uh, we have that this is satisfied n from this one to zero at zero when n is zero, this is zero. So one, two, three, and any positive natural number of n are the solutions that we have here. And so the general solution then is the sum of all of these acceptable solutions.
And uh, as long as this series is uniformly convergent, which we can uh, very easily show that it will be uniformly convergent for a certain uh, class of initial conditions, um, where we have that this is this infinite summation is the general solution to uh, this partial differential equation because um, we have that if this is a uniform convergent series we can do term by term differentiation and uh, this infinite series will go through go ahead and, and satisfy uh, this partial differential equation. So the only thing that is left to do, that we have left to do here, is to satisfy um, our general initial condition. Um, and sure enough, uh, we have a distinct way of going through and satisfying our initial condition. The initial condition here is u at x comma zero equals zero is the summation from n equals one to infinity of bn times e to the zero which is one times sine of omega n times x or if you will the summation n equals 1 to infinity of bn times sine of n pi over b times x. And the initial condition has to be the function f of x, whatever this is. And based on our previous work, we recognize this immediately as the Fourier sine series, or the odd the Fourier sine series being the uh, the odd Fourier extension of f of x. So the Fourier series that converges to f of x on the interval from zero to b. So we know immediately how to go through and calculate these uh, coefficients bn using our orthogonality relations, <coughs> specifically bn is going to end up being 2 over b, where b is the length of this interval, times the integral from 0 to the end of the interval of f of x times sine of n pi over b times x dx. Right, and there you have it. Right, This now gives us uh, the Fourier series solution to our heat equation problem for any initial condition where uh, the Fourier sine series is a valid series. Um, and sure enough, you know, any initial condition that you can think of, uh, piecewise, continuous, you know, nice, nice function f of x, uh, will give you a convergent, uh, uniformly convergent uh, Fourier sine series. Um, so this is very, very, very cool. Very, very, very incredible. Um, I'll just do one specific example here. This is relevant to uh, the homework problem. And that is, uh, let's go through and do this for the specific initial condition u of x not f of x is equal to x on the interval from 0 to b over 2 And from b over 2 to b, the function l or b minus x. And 
And so for this problem, Bn is going to be 2 over B times the integral from 0 to B of f of x times sine of n pi over b times x. Which is 2 over b times the integral from 0 to b of x, or b over 2, of x times sine of n pi over b times x dx plus the integral from b over 2 to b of b minus x times sine of n pi over b times x dx using the fact that um, uh, the definite integral <coughs> can be split into uh, sum for piecewise functions like this. When we go through and use integration by parts <clears throat> on each one of these integrals, we end up getting that bn will be 2 over b times b over n squared pi squared times b sine of n pi over 2 minus n b pi over 2 times cosine of n pi over 2. That's this first integral right here. And the second integral that we get is the b squared over n squared pi squared multiplied by sine of n pi over 2 plus n pi times cosine, let me call it more space here, n pi over 2, over 2. So we have a little bit of cancellation here. Uh, you can factor out the b squared over n squared pi squared. It's going to be 2 times b. You have b squared over n squared pi squared here. And this will be times sine of n pi over 2 plus sine of n pi over 2 gives you 2 times sine of n pi over 2. And here you have minus n pi over 2 cosine of n pi over 2. And then from this term right here you have plus n pi over 2 times cosine of n pi over 2. These two terms actually cancel one another. We're just left with the simplified equation 4b over n squared pi squared times sine 
of n pi over 2. So the general solution for the heat equation with these specific boundary conditions and initial conditions is this infinite sum with this specific bn function. Or explicitly, if we plug in before b over n squared pi squared times sine of n pi over 2 times e to the negative n pi over b squared oh, times k here. A little typo here, we should have k right here. This infinite sum is the solution to the general solution to the heat equation that satisfies this initial condition and the boundary conditions I uh, talked about before. And let me fix this right here as well because this should be k. So if you want to go through and plot this for various values of time, uh, I recommend going through and doing this using Desmos or Python. I wrote uh, my own custom Python code to actually give me an animation of this uh, for various values of t. And the the, uh, the downside of using this uh, in code is that you have to uh, uh, you can only do the finite sum, so you can only uh, plot out for a finite n finitely many terms of this Fourier series expansion. Or it's this sum, not from 1 to infinity, but from 1 to n. That being said, uh, if your coefficients are nice enough, uh, you'll have good convergence. Um, if you don't have nice convergence, or you don't have fast convergence, you'll have to use more sums, more terms in your sum, uh, which will result in uh, uh, maybe possibly artifacts. Um, uh, so like the Gibbs phenomena at any discontinuities. Um, it's not as much of an issue with the heat equation, but we will see that when we plot out our solution to the wave equation with uh, discontinuous um, or a, a, a poorly chosen initial condition. Uh, however, this uh, does sum, it converges to the exact solution as n goes to infinity. So let's take a look at this right now. And here I have a decimal screen, but I'll open up the solution to the heat equation. And this uh, is the initial condition in blue with uh, evolving solution to the heat equation in time uh, with fixed uh, endpoints at zero. You see uh, that very clearly uh, this is what you would expect for uh, you know, a heat problem, a sort of smoothing of your initial condition. Um, and uh, this is really quite incredible uh, that this, this works out so nicely. And uh, it works out so nicely for so many uh, very basic um, uh, separable partial differential equations. So uh, we don't, we aren't limited to only the 1D heat equation. We can do this with the 2D heat equation, uh, with uh, the 1D wave equation, the 2D wave equation, the uh, 1D potential equation, the 2D potential equation, and even the 3D uh, versions of each one of these equations as well. This is very incredible.
So let's see an example of extending this process to the heat equation 2D. And we'll take a look at this and see uh, what the, the differences are. And we'll have to see how similar this is um, in uh, 2D. So the constant coefficient heat equation 2D is K times the second derivative of temperature with respect to X plus the second derivative of temperature U with respect to Y is equal to the derivative of a U with respect to T, where U is a function of X, Y, and T. So this is the partial differential equation, and again, um, in order to uh, uh, have a, this be solvable uh, as a separable partial differential equation, or in order for this to be a separable PDE, um, we have to have certain boundary conditions. Um, now, these are not the only boundary conditions that give you a separable PDE, but uh, the easiest boundary conditions to take are zero on the boundary points, just like before. And in a little bit, I'll show how to do the wave equation with slightly different boundary conditions. So for the 2D heat equation, we'll take the boundary conditions to be zero at both boundaries. With the PDE being over the finite domain, From 0 to B and X, and from 0 to C and Y. So we need uh, four separate boundary conditions on each one of these boundaries. And our initial condition is going to be u at t equals 0 is equal to some function f of x, y. And just like before, we start with step one, which is the ansatz of looking for solutions that are separable or of the form of a function of x times the function of y. times a function of t. But things will be a little bit more complicated now. Because when we plug this substitution into our partial differential equation, we get k times x prime prime times y times t plus x times y prime prime times t is equal to x times y times t prime. 
which is a little bit more complicated than the 1D case. However, we can still go through and simplify this. Um, the first thing that I recommend doing is dividing by x times y times t. to get k times x prime prime over x plus y prime prime over y is equal to t prime over t. which is in fact the same thing if we uh, rewrite this a little bit as x prime prime over x is equal to t prime over t times k minus y prime prime over y. Which, just like before, is um, a ratio of function of only x here and this entire thing is function and it's also a ratio function of y and of t. For the same reason as before, we have to conclude that this is going to be equal to some constant negative lambda. which gives you two separate equations that have to be satisfied. x prime prime over x is equal to negative lambda and this function right here is equal to negative lambda. which we can again say, because this is a function of ratio, a function of only t, and this is a ratio that's a function of only y, that this entire thing has to be equal to or t prime over k times t plus lambda has to be equal to y prime prime over y Because this is a function of only t, and this is a function of only y, this has to be equal to negative mu, where negative mu is another separation constant. And just like before, this now gives us three separate uh, differential equations that we have to solve for x, x prime prime minus lambda times x is equal to zero,
y prime prime oh I sorry, plus lambda times x equals zero y prime prime plus mu times y is equal to zero and t prime plus k times lambda plus mu times t is equal to zero. And just like before, in the 1D case, uh, we can go through and solve these. Um, first off, we know that T of T will be equal to T naught times E to the negative K lambda plus mu times t and we can also go through a similar procedure uh, to the 1D case to solve both of these differential equations and satisfy the relevant boundary conditions the relevant stern louisville problem for each one of the uh, differential equations here And when we do that, specifically, we get that x of x, or I should say x m of x, is equal to some constant a star m times sine of m pi over b times x. And likewise, we can go through and show that the only non-trivial solutions for y are the solutions yn of y equal to some constant a cross n sine of n pi over c times y. where uh, and only non-trivial lambda that satisfy this are lambda equals lambda m, which is m pi over b squared, and mu equals mu n, which is n pi over c squared. The procedure is uh, almost exactly the same to the previous example that I went through and did uh, when we went through and solved for the boundary conditions and showed that uh, there are no non-trivial solutions for these specific boundary conditions. Uh, only when uh, C is a specific value of, um, uh, it depends on N. This means that T in general would be a function of T and uh, be indexed by M and N. Specifically, it'll be T M N, where uh, T M N naught is times E to the negative K times. M pi over B squared plus N pi over C squared times T. And so then for every M value, or M equals zero, and 
in uh, zero we don't even really care about because the sine of zero is zero. So m equals one, two, three, and so on and so forth. And for every n value, we have a, a solution that's separable of the form u m n of x y t is equal to this function times this function times this function multiplied by some arbitrary constant a m n and any uh, solution of this form satisfies both boundary conditions uh, that we initially put on the problem and by the linearity of this pde uh, the most general solution then is going to be the sum over all m and all n of this expression right here specifically u of x y t is going to be a double summation n from 1 to infinity m from 1 to infinity of this expression right here And at first, this might look a little bit daunting because we haven't really done Fourier series with double summations. However, um, the process for solving for the Fourier series coefficients uh, is uh, exactly the same. Not only that, but uh, when we plug in our initial condition, uh, we'll get a series that we can do the Fourier series sine series process on. Let's go through and take a look at this. So in terms of uh, putting this up to step, I say step one is the separable case where you get your differential equations. Uh, step two is going through and solving the Sturm-Louisville problem for satisfying the boundary conditions. And then uh, step three is putting everything together and solving for the coefficients. And we can do that directly because we know that our initial condition is of the form of a function of x and y. And for this uh, infinite summation right here, when t is 0, e to the 0 is 1. So we end up being left with this infinite summation right here. So as long as uh, this sum, this double sum, is uniformly convergent, um, then we uh, have that this is uh, a, a valid solution to our problem because we can do term by term differentiation and everything works out perfect. Um, so to solve for these coefficients a, m, n, uh, we're going to do the exact same thing uh, that we did in 1D, which is uh, do a Fourier for a sine series expansion of this function f of x, y. And you remember that we do this by considering the uh, inner product, the function inner product of both sides of this expression with some arbitrary uh, element uh, p, q. And this gives us an expression of the form f of x, y times 
sine of p pi over p times x times sine of q pi over c times y. And on the right hand side, we get this exact same expression. multiplied by each term in our infinite sum. And uh, as long as this is a uniformly convergent series, uh, we can go through and integrate this term by term. And if we do this, double integral from 0 to b in x and 0 to c in y. And on the right hand side we get infinite summation of double integral of amn or amn times the double integral from 0 to b 0 to c of this entire expression right here dy dx. And one of the things that you want to recall is that um, if you have uh, a function that's in the form of a product, uh, the double integral of a rectangular domain uh, becomes the product of two single variable integrals. Specifically, this integral right here is going to be nothing more than the product. of the integral from 0 to b of sine of m pi over b times x sine of p pi over b times x dx multiplied by the integral from 0 to c of sine of n pi over c times y sine of q pi over c times y. Which are two uh, 1D integrals that we know very well uh, from our orthogonality orthogonality relations previous. Um, this integral is going to be zero if m is not equal to p and the only time it's going to be non-zero is if m is equal to p in which case it will be p over 2. Similarly, this integral right here is going to be 0. If n is not equal to q, 
the only time that it will be non-zero is when n is equal to q, which gives you a value of c over 2. Which means every single term in this infinite sum is 0, except for the one term where m equals p and n equals q gives you a p q times b over 2 times c over 2 which gives you that a p q is going to be 4 over b times c times this double integral right here. which gives us a direct formula for the coefficients in that infinite sum from before. So the general solution to this problem with these specific boundary conditions is going to be this infinite sum, where uh, AMN is defined by this equation right here. Any MN is defined by this equation right here. And so let's go through and do this for two separate examples. First example we'll, we'll consider is initial condition f x y being equal to piecewise function that's zero. if x, y is not in the rectangle from L over 4, is it 3 L over 4? Or uh, B over 4, 3 B over 4. And y is in the interval, not in the interval from c over 4 to 3c over 4. This is like saying you take an initial square of temperature 1 and every, every other temperature is zero. And when we do this, we end up getting that A M N The integral for AMN will simplify very nicely. Because if f of x is 0 off of this uh, rectangle, then 1 on the rectangle. And this integral will become the integral from p over 4 to 3b over 4. And from c over 4 to 3c over 4. With this expression right here, 
because that's the one which, after an iteration, ends up becoming four over b times c. times 2 times b times sine of m pi over 4 sine of m pi over 2 divided by m times pi times 2c over n times pi times sine of n pi over 4 sine of m n pi over 2 where you can go through and simplify this a little bit more uh, but if you take this and directly go through and, and verify we can clearly see that this is the correct solution so i went in and made some python code just like for that 1d case to, to visualize this And sure enough, I'll open that up right now. We'll take a look at it. This right here is a visualization of uh, the sum for the first 100 terms in that series, 100 terms in M and 100 terms in N. And sure enough, you see that because this is a discontinuous function, you do have some Gibbs phenomena going on at the discontinuous edges initially, but uh, because of the negative exponential, that gets smoothed out uh, very, very quickly. And you see that... Um, this uh, animation right here is very clearly showing uh, the correct solution to this, uh, this heat equation problem. For the values of B and C here, I used value 4 and uh, 0 to 4 in X and 0 to 5 in Y. I encourage you to go through and we do another one or two problems just to make sure that you have the process down. Uh, but sure enough, uh, you know, when I went through this for another problem, a separate initial condition, just to kind of verify, uh, you can you, you get the exact same result. You're always going to have this smoothing effect. Um, the heat equation solution, naturally, you expect the temperature distribution to slowly uh, flow out, or the temperature is slowly flow out if the boundary conditions are at a constant temperature here. This is exactly what we're seeing. So another good initial condition to try out just to make sure that everything's going smoothly. We say f of x, y is equal to b minus x times c minus y, which gives you a slightly different integral when you go through and evaluate the, uh, the coefficients here. We get the integral, the double integral of the function b minus x times c minus y. This is another relatively straightforward integral to go through and evaluate. Um, and when you do this, you actually get that this is going to simplify down to 4 over b times c times b e squared times c squared over m and pi. Or just four B 
C over M and pi. So, and there should be M here and there should be N here if we're using uh, M and N. So the general solution is the infinite sum from before with these coefficients plugged in and I'll actually do that for this one because um, these coefficients are a little bit shorter for this example. General solution is four B C over M times M times pi. And sure enough, if we plot this out and visualize this. The solution that we get is uh, clearly uh, behaving exactly as we expect. So this is very, very neat. And uh, the last example that I want to show is how to do this for the wave equation in 1D and in 2D.